once again I keep here we are congregated to open your word and to see what information is made plain so we can understand it help us to see what you are trying to show this generation help us to follow Jesus in his footsteps and understanding what he has laid down for us bless the speaker and bless our hearts and our minds and understanding in Jesus name Amen there's um, another handout which has got all the Bible verses which has the word clay in it so I've got that and there's a third sheet what does the third sheet look like? Just making sure it looks like the, the unstapled one the other one yeah oh yeah that one and you've got another sheet which is looks like this <coughs> and it's got a little study on the word clay in Daniel chapter 2 so there's many things to look at in Daniel chapter 2 but we're looking at the issue of the clay and I'm hopefully going to demonstrate that in Daniel chapter 2 when we deal with the word clay and it comes up in two variants it says there's potter's clay <coughs> and miry clay there are many people in the church who when they see these uh, these two phrases they see some kind of downward progression with the inference that this is good and it becomes bad and they begin to apply history and other pieces of logic to to demonstrate that point of view so what I want to show hopefully is that this is not a correct view but in fact this potter's clay is bad and the miry clay is bad and if there is any progression it's to say that there's this bad clay and it gets to a state where God is going to end up dealing with this problem so if there is some kind of progression it's that this clay is in a state of um, rebellion against God and then God addresses the issue but hopefully we're going to see that it's not going from good to bad so, so that's really all I'm going to be addressing um, in, in this evening's devotion because there's quite a lot to to get through in Daniel chapter 2 um, <clears throat> So if we turn to this sheet here, which says chapter 2 on the top of it, what I've done is I've got um, verses from Daniel 2. I've only um, printed out the verses that are pertinent to the issue of clay. And it's on two columns. On the left-hand column, you've got the description of the dream. This is Daniel telling um, Nebuchadnezzar what he saw in the dream. And on the right-hand side, it's parallel verses that show that is that give the interpretation of what this what this means that's kind of what it is um, it's not that straightforward but um, let's read verse 33 so in verse 33 um, we read his legs of iron his feet part of iron and part of clay and if we go around and read verses 41 <coughs> to 43 41 to 43. Daniel 2 verse 41. And it reads as follows. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of God's display and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with my reflection. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, 
so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So be because of the shortness of time, we're not going into the previous verses, but if we were to run through those verses, um, we'd see in verse 38 that it says that Nebuchadnezzar is his head of gold. Then if we drop down to verse 39, it would say, and after thee, <coughs> after Nebuchadnezzar, there shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee. Second part of the verse says, and another third kingdom. So in verse 39, we see that there will be, by the time we get to verse 39, it says that there are three kingdoms that are listed. And we know when it says, thou art this head of gold, it's not referring to Nebuchadnezzar, because it says, after thee. And we know that the king that comes after him, there are a number of kings that come after him. So when it says thee, it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar as a representative of the nation of Babylon. In verse 40 says, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. So verse 40 takes us to the fourth kingdom. Then we've just read verses 41, 42 and 43. And in 41 it says, Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of uh, potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom. So the first thing we want to pick up, um, this was verse 40, that in verse 41 it says, the kingdom. <coughs> And in verse 40, it said the fourth kingdom. So, whatever we're going to see in verse 41, we know it's talking about the same kingdom as verse 40. And verse 42 says the same. It says the kingdom. <coughs> the the indicates in the definite article, which refers us back to verse 40. So, verse 41 and 42 are going to take us back to verse 40. I'll read verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So what, or the only point I'm picking up here is that in the, in the statue there are only four kingdoms listed, and when you go <coughs> from the legs into the feet into the toes, it consistently labels it as the fourth kingdom. There are only four kingdoms in this chapter. So whatever the feet and toes are, they're the same kingdom as the legs of iron. And in a previous um, worship, it's already been discussed that whenever Rome is brought to view in Daniel 2, 7, 8 and 11, that you see Rome in its two phases. In Daniel, you see it brought to view in two ways, different body parts and then the introduction of this clay. So you see these different of materials. In Daniel 7, you can see it between the iron beast and the ten horns that are part of that beast, and it says after them arises another little horn. So you see the same imagery, Rome coming in two phases. In Daniel 8, it gets really hard to see the two phases of Rome because it's not done in the, the imagery isn't the same. So you have to look a bit deeper and you see this gender oscillation between verses 9 to 12 in the masculine and feminine form. Then in Daniel 11, it gets even harder to see because the only information that you're given is the title of King of the North and the way to distinguish that is that you need to have a good understanding of all the previous chapters and then you need to delve into the history that those verses deal with. The issue of the daily becomes important in Daniel 11 to be able to locate when you get this transfer of the King of the North. And the other difficulty in, in Daniel 11 is that not only is Rome in its two phases called the King of the North, so is the empire that comes before it which is Greece. So, without a, a good understanding of the previous chapters, when you get into Daniel 11, it's hard to be able to distinguish which, which phrases of Rome that you're dealing with. So, I think there's general consensus that Rome comes in these two phases. So, that's the first point we want to bring out, that it's talking about the Fourth Kingdom. There's a general agreement that the Fourth Kingdom is Rome. So, however we want to look at what this clay is dealing with, my contention is that, first of all, it's Rome. The second point that I want to bring up, which is just a kind of a, a, a general point, is that, and we didn't read all the verses past that, that when we look at Daniel chapter 2, um, there's a juxtaposition between the statue and the mountain that's discussed. And we know that out of the mountain, um, 
a little um, a, a stone is cut out with how, without hands. So from my understanding is that there's this comparison made between these two images, these two symbols. And it tells us in the verse that once this stone separates from the mountain, that this has been identified <coughs> as the kingdom of God. So my contention is when the stone is in the mountain prior to this, in this portion of history, when it looks like this, that this is the kingdom of God. So you get the kingdom of God to be in a mountain, uh, then you get a separation of the stone in the mountain, this becomes the kingdom of God. It hits the statue, and we, we haven't read all of these verses. Uh, when it hits the statue, it comes away, and then this stone grows into a mountain which fills the earth. And it says that this too is, becomes the kingdom of God. So throughout the imagery of Daniel 2, you can see that these mountains, uh, this mountain here and this mountain, represent God's kingdom. So my contention is that whatever is in this statue, it doesn't represent God's kingdom. So um, I'll just put this as Satan's kingdom. And if it's Satan's kingdom, one of the arguments that I bring to view is that this potter's clay cannot be good because if the potter's clay was good, it must have, at some level, prophetically, been part of God's kingdom. Now, I know we can go into the history of all of this and we can see the development of the papacy as it came through the New Testament church. We could go to Second Thessalonians and address all those issues. But at the prophetic level, God is showing us that there are these two kingdoms that are warring once, one against another and all the imagery that's brought to view in, uh, with respect to the statue is all dealing with Satan's kingdom and these mountains, this mountain here, then the stone um, and then this stone develops into a mountain is all dealing with God's response or God's kingdom. And you can see this same pattern brought to view in Daniel 7, Daniel 8 and Daniel 11. The imagery is different. In Daniel 7 it talks about the judgment. In Daniel 8 it talks about the cleansing of the sanctuary and in Daniel 11, it talks about the glorious holy mountain and that warfare that goes on that mountain in verse 45. And I'm saying that all of those chapters lay one on top of the other, giving different pieces of information, but they're all following the same pattern. So whatever this statue represents, all the materials that, it, that, that, are, that it's composed of are all part of Satan's kingdom. Therefore, by definition, the potter's clay could never have been good. It, it must have been bad at this prophetic level, regardless of how we want to try and dovetail history into this and see how the papacy came forth out of, out of the New Testament church. So there are two starting points that we want to address. Um, the other thing that I want to just, just highlight, um, which I'm not going to deal with, but I just want to point out, when we look at the, the Millerites and how they address this iron and clay, up to 1844, and for most of the history after that, when they looked at the iron and clay, basically they said that these were the nations of Europe. Strong, and weak. So they developed this argument that from the legs, which was pagan Rome, that in the breakup of pagan Rome, that in the western part of the, of the empire, it breaks down into these ten Germanic tribes that are brought to view on these stones here, these ten tribes, not dealing with the issue of three of them getting plucked up. And some of them are stronger, some of them are weak. That's how they address this issue, the breakup or the division of Rome. Now, when we read the first spirit prophecy quote, which I'm not going to read because we've already read it before, it's in, um, and most people are familiar with it, Ellen White says that the iron and clay do not represent that, that they represent state and church, which... <coughs> at first sight seems to be in opposition with what the Millerites teach. But there's this second quote that she gives, which is taken from Testament of the Church, Volume 1, 
page 360, paragraph 3. And I don't know who's next on the reading list. Could you read that? The second paragraph. Yes. Our kingdom is not of this world. We are waiting for our Lord from heaven to come to earth to put down all authority and power and set up this everlasting kingdom. Earthly powers are shaken. We need not and cannot expect union among the nations of the earth. Our position in the image of Nebuchadnezzar is represented, re represented by the toes in, in a divided state and of a crumbling material that will not hold together. Prophecy shows us that the great day of God is right upon us. It hastes greatly. So, my understanding of this passage is that she's saying that the iron and the clay, when they join together, represents this union that is that, that mixes but doesn't cleave, and, and we'll look at that in a moment, um, but it's of a crumbling nature. And she refers this, it says, the earthly powers are shaken. We, know, we need not and cannot expect union among the nations of the earth. So I'm understanding that to mean that she's inferring that the iron and the clay are represented by this imagery, strong and weak nations who are trying to come together, but they're not able to make it. So the only reason I'm, I'm mentioning that is that when we look at the Millerites' viewpoint on what the feet and toes represent, often we just discredit everything that they say and, they say, and we say they just made a mistake and this is the correct understanding and we ignore what they teach because obviously they're going to be teaching that by the time you get to the toes, you're at 1844, you're at the end of the world and they developed a very sophisticated argument to show all of that and sometimes we just discredit all of that. But I think this passage at least begins to open the way to, uh, for us to consider that there's at least this, that there's this dual application of what the iron and clay is. But we're focusing on this one because this is where our attention is today. But I wanted to just point out that I don't think the Millerites had made as much of a mistake as, as we might think that they did. Um, My razor. Um, oh. I don't think I agree. I know what you're saying is logical on one level. <coughs> But um, I think that it says potter's clay for a reason. I think I think this is the reason. I, for I haven't got to the potter's clay yet. Oh, okay. I haven't got to that argument. All I'm just pointing out in this point is that the Millerites taught that they were strong and weak nations who cannot join together. And I think Testimonies Volume One shows that they have some legitimacy in that argument. There's this there's this dual symbology going here with the iron and clay. But we focus upon this one. That's where our focus is going to be. This testimony just uh, read. Do you know when it was written? I don't, but it's in the early part. Of <coughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, just a quick question. You know when she says we're in the toes, is she, is she saying, is the reason why she's saying toes is because like, she's referring to the fact that we're at the end of the world? She says toes? She just says toes. She, she, she says toes in that passage. I didn't want to spend my time analysing this verse, oh, yeah. but I really brought it to our attention because at first sight it's not, it, it's, it's a different perspective than the paragraph above it because she says that they're in the feet at that stage and now she says they're in the toes. So I'm just saying that if we think this is just a straightforward simple argument of the geography of this statue that we want to either make it a foot or a toe, it's not that straightforward because if we're going to bring this to the end of the world and she says here we're in, the, we're in the toes and we talk about the toes being the United Nations at the end of the world, th there's more to this than, than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. that, that's all I'm saying. And, it, and I think it opens an avenue to re-examine the Millerite position, how they, how they understood that. Because most people, when they look at this chart, they just say, this is actually an incorrect understanding <coughs> and it's a mistake that's on the chart. And what I'm suggesting is, that I don't think is as much as a mistake. I don't fully understand how to explain it, but it's not as much as a mistake that we, that we suggest that it is. Because they're clearly telling you that the iron and the clay is not church and state. They, they speak about it often. And Ellen White here is, I think, confirming that. But she also said that it is church and state. 
that, that's the only point I'm bringing up there. Are you saying that mm-hmm. said that it wasn't church and state? Then? I don't think they say it's not. They just talk about it being strong nations yeah. and, and weak nations who can't come together. and. Because Miller, Miller says that, that it is at one level. <coughs> okay. Do you, oh, do you want to read that? I, I, I read it, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's just go quickly to this. Um, I think there are, on the last page it tells you all the Bible verses that deal with the word clay. There's 30 Bible verses, and I've gone through all of them, and I've given the, the, the definitions of them all. Some of them are more pertinent than others. What I've done is I've given the Hebrew definition of those words, I've laid out the verses and I've given just a, a, a summary title of what those verses mean, in my opinion. You might, you might see it to, be, to mean something else. So, 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, um, 1 Kings 17, 46 and 2 Chronicles 4, 17 are both dealing with the construction of Solomon's temple and how all the brazen instruments were, were manufactured. And it's basically talking about going to... Um, this area and forming moulds out of the ground. That, that's all that's dealing with. I don't think it has any particular relevance to us. Um, yeah? Go. go ahead. Um, okay, it says, this is Miller, Miller's works, volume 2, um, page 42 and 46. And I'm just going to read this. So read loudly. Uh, okay. The legs of iron and the feet, part of iron and part of clay, fitly represent the Roman kingdom which still exists, although in a broken state, like iron and clay. This kingdom has been divided between pagan Rome, now he understands things a little differently than we do here, but nevertheless, the head wounded to death, and papal Rome, the deadly wound healed, both (coughs) mixing themselves with the seed of men, that is, uniting church and state. So he's saying that this kingdom in its divided state is mixing church and state, and that's what this condition of iron and clay represents. Okay. <coughs> um, on the second page, I've gone through a number of verses here, and I've explained what those verses are. I'm not, I don't think we're going to take the time to read them all. The only point I want to bring out on this second list, th- th- there are quite a few verses that are brought to view here. If you spend the time reading through these verses, what you'll see is that every time the word clay hap- uh, is, is brought to view, whenever it says clay, it's always talking about a formed vessel. There are only a couple of verses that the Bible brings to view that, um, if, if this is my crude picture of a, of a potter's wheel, that there's a lump of clay on it, which a potter is going to now form or shape into something. The vast majority of all the verses is talking about clay that's already formed into a vessel. So you start off with clay like this, and then it gets shaped into a vessel, obviously it gets fired, and then it's used. And almost all the verses speak about clay in this form and not in this form. And, and, when, and the few verses that it does speak about this, it actually speaks about um, clay in this form that is going to be made into a vessel. So that's the other point that we, I want to bring up, which is an important point. And I think the reason I'm bringing that up is there's a misunderstanding about potter's clay. People tend to think that potter's clay is talking about clay in this state, that God is going to form into something uh, for his service. But all the places that I found the word, of the, the, the word clay, it's always talking about clay that's already been formed into a vessel, except for a few places. And when it's talking about that, it, um, they're, they're a unique situation. And if I can just quickly, um, maybe I'll be able to scan and see which ones they are. So the first ones, I've, I've, I've got ones from Job. Um, there's, there's quite a selection from Job, uh, from Isaiah and from Jeremiah. And all of these passages are all talking about clay that's already been formed not clay that's on a potter's wheel. Eighteen sixty eight, first testament is eighteen sixty eight. Okay. Sorry? 
wall fills. Yeah. In the back, nobody wants to. We're on to the next page, and this is uh, dealing with Psalms chapter 40, um, Isaiah 41, and Nahum uh, chapter 3. And again, if we were to read through these verses, we'll see that uh, actually these verses aren't, aren't really pertinent to, to what we're talking about. It, it's talk, it talks about the use of clay in, in, a, in a way that isn't germane to our discussion here. So we're going to turn over the page again, and you'll see in Jeremiah 43 again, if you look at the context of that, um, it's not talking about clay in, in any particular way. It's talking about some other issue. And that brings us down to um, Daniel, thir- Daniel, chap- well, well, Daniel chapter 2. So w- w- let's turn to Daniel chapter 2. We're on that page. Um, one, two... We're on page six. It does. You get you get variations of the word. Yes. Yes. <coughs> yeah. I'm going to try and look at that too. Because even at that level, you could say the potter's clay and my clay are identical because you use sticky moist clay to form vessels. So in Daniel chapter 2, if you turn it, from Daniel chapter 2, verse 4, from Daniel chapter 2, verse 4, to Daniel chapter 7, verse 28, all the words there are not in Hebrew. All those chapters that begin from verse 2 and end in uh, verse 28, they're actually in Aramaic. They're not Hebrew words. So a problem that you tend to find is if you do a word study in any of those chapters, that you'll find very limited words, and you have to research it a little bit more to be able to find a wider <coughs> usage of that word. Because, as I said, they're only Aramaic words. So, for instance, if you went to Daniel chapter 2 and you looked up the word clay there, you'll only find that it comes up a few times. Um, only, in fact, only in the book of Daniel in chapter 2 because it's an Aramaic word and you won't find it anywhere else in scripture. You have to look for a Hebrew equivalent for it. So that's something that people get tripped up on sometimes. So we're looking at the word clay and in verse 33 it just says clay. Daniel 2.33 and his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. If you look up this word clay, it's on, the, it's on the page, it's H2635. And if you go to the top of the page, I've given the definition of it, H2635. And in Brown Driver Briggs, it says clay or potsherd. In Strong's, it just says uh, a clod. But I want to pick up this idea that the clay that's brought to view here is actually a potsherd. So we'll define what a potsherd is as we go along. This is, where the, this is where the difference begins to occur, is that in Daniel 2, the word clay that's brought to view here, its definition is a potsherd. And this word potsherd can have varying, underst- various meanings in the Bible, but however you understand it, at one level, it's talking about a vessel. Some kind of clay that's already been made up into some kind of container or vessel. And you see that in the definition of the word itself. So when he says that his legs, he, his legs of wine, feet part of wine and part of clay, my contention is that clay is not wet, sticky clay. It's clay that's already been made by a potter. A potter has already worked on it and it turned, he's already turned it into a vessel. Um, verse 34 will give you the same information. There's no more information in verse 34. Uh, and neither is there in verse 35. So 33, 34, 35 just says the word clay and it gives you no more information than that. And I'm contending that the word clay there should be understood to be a potsherd or a vessel. 
we've looked at H2635, and at the, just at the bottom section of that, it says from a root corresponding to that of H2636. And if you go back down to that word there, and it's, it's printed out for you, it's the definition in Brown Driver Briggs says to peel, to flake off, scale like, flake like, scaled off. And in Strong's, it has a very similar definition. It says a shred or scale. So what I'm suggesting is from the very definition of the word that's used in Daniel 2 from verses 33 to 35, it's not talking about wet, sticky, muddy clay. It's talking about clay that's already been fired. And then in its, the word that it comes from, it says to peel or to flake. So here we have some flaky clay. It says it's either been peeled or flaky. So it's going to begin to open up what kind of condition this vessel is. And I've drawn it in this way, but we're going to see that actually the vessel doesn't look like this. It's actually peeled or flakes of clay. What is, what is, what is flaky? Um, Piece, small pieces, yes. <coughs> so if you uh, if you got a carrot and you grated it in a grater, you'd get little pieces or little flakes of carrot. So that's what these flakes are. This this thing's been broken up and it and it's in the form of little flakes. So that's from just that's just from the definition of the word. Um, so. We're in verse 35, no, we did verse 35, verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. So in verse 41, it brings to, brings to view these terms of potter's clay and miry clay. I've not given the definition for potter, for the word potter. Pottery is just someone who works with pottery. It's a straightforward definition, so I've not, issued, I've not dealt with that. The word clay is identical to the word clay that's used in verses 33, 34 and 35. It's this flaky, dry type of a clay. So when it says potter's clay, I'm saying potter's clay is clay that's been worked by a potter and it's not wet, muddy clay that's been worked. It's clay that has been worked at its most basic level, it's a vessel, some kind of flask, but it's in a flaking condition, so it actually looks like this. So the definition of potter's clay is this. It's not the definition that we might think of it. But if a potter works with clay, doesn't this mean that it has to be clean clay? As I mean potter's clay, pure clay, because you cannot burn dirty clay? I'm not tackling the issue at the moment about whether the clay that he used was clean or dirty. I'm just dealing <coughs> with the symbol. Okay. It, 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 it's like a snapshot. It says when, it, when, you, when it's using this phrase in Daniel 2, it says potter's clay. It's taking a snapshot and the snapshot it's taking is that this symbol is representing clay that looks like this. It, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that the clay, <coughs> the pieces of clay were actually good or bad or dirty or clean at this stage. I'm just saying this is what it looks like because we're going to see some Bible verses, hopefully, that actually see, show you that when you see clay in this form, it will define what kind of clay it is. Okay. Okay? Then verse, uh, so we're in verse 41, and then it picks up the word miry clay. So we've quickly looked at the word potter's clay, and we're going to look at the word miry clay now. Again, the word clay is the same gives us the same description. At its most basic level, it would be this kind of vessel, but it's actually just talking about flaky clay. So this is where it begins to, people begin to get problems, because if you look at the definition for Myri, <coughs> on the previous page, it's H2917, and its basic definition is either clay, in fact, that's all, it's, that's all it says in uh, Brown Driver Bridge and Strong, it says clay or clay, then it says, from a word, H2916. Now, if you look at H2916, which is one level down, then the definition says mud, clay, mire, damp, dirt. And from Strong's, it says from an unused root meaning, apparently to be sticky. So this is where people begin to get have questions. 
because this looks like it's wet, sticky clay. So if you had miry clay, these two words are not portraying the same <coughs> information when, when you consider that this miry is defined by wet and sticky. But if we go, um, I, I, let me just finish this point and I'll take some questions in a minute. Just the same definition that you get from Strong, I think mine gives it a little bit better explanation to the point that you want to go. It says to be sticky to the idea of dirt to be swept yes. away. So, so I'm going down one more level, because <coughs> you need to go down one more level for that. So we're at H2916, and at H2916 it's sticky, then in brackets or parentheses it says, rather perhaps a denominative form, uh, a denominative from H2894. And H2894 is the root word of all of this miriness, and it says to sweep away, or to sweep or to sweep away. So if you go and trace the word miry all the way down, its base definition is dirt that is ready to sweep away. And I think this is the imagery that's being portrayed by the term miry clay. The word miry is portraying that this clay is in a condition that it's dirt that's ready to be swept away. It's not portraying the imagery that it's wet and sticky. So when you combine <coughs> potter's clay here, it's the potter's worked on clay, formed a vessel, and now it's in a flaky condition, which is basically these small shards. Miry clay is that these shards or this clay is like dirt that's ready to be swept away. So when you combine miry <coughs> and clay, it says that these shards now are ready to be swept away. They were formed by a, uh, a potter, they were broken, and now they're ready to be, swoyed, to be swept away. So that brings us back to here. I haven't proven yet that it's bad, but I'm saying if there is a progression, it's broken pieces of pottery which are now ready to be swept away. So. It tells you the condition, it tells you what the judgment that's going to happen upon this clay. And you can see that through the definition of both of those words. Um, that is, that seems consistent with the idea that at the end of the world, um, the world is ready, or is being threshed. It's on the threshing floor and, and the next step after being threshed is to be blown away. Yes. Um, and, and, and the difficulty is we can't make all of those yeah, other, that, other thoughts to, yeah. To, to bear upon that. In verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. It just deals with the word clay in verse 42. And then verse 43 gives us some other information. <coughs> and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. I'm not dealing with the issue of the seed of men, because it again we'll get distracted but what verse 43 is going to show us is that the iron and the clay it says miry clay are mixed together and this mixture is right at the very end of the world it's in this condition here where it's dirt that's ready to be swept away there's going to be some interaction between the iron and the clay and the seed of men but it says in the wording it says that they mix and then it says uh, but they do not cleave. And we could go to other Bible verses to define what this cleaving is, but it's really dealing with the issue of, of a legitimate marriage situation where two people become one flesh. So they're able to mix together, they can have some kind of relationship. And my suggestion to that of that is that you have church and I've rubbed it out, you have church and state and they're able to mix, they're able to marry, but it's not a marriage that's a one flesh marriage because by definition a church cannot marry a state um, because it's not in God's order. So, so the word in verse 43 shows us that there's this church state relationship. They're able to work together, but they can't become one flesh. And the other point that we want to bring up is the word cleave means to stick together. So if this was some kind of potter's clay that was being formed into something, then by definition, if we had a lump of clay and we got pieces of iron and we 
put that to that, the iron and the clay would stick together, they would cleave. But the fact that all this imagery is telling us that we've got clay in this form, what, we're in, what we've actually got is this situation where if we think of a container and we put a, a mixer in it, we can put iron in here and we can put clay in here and sure, we can mix them together and get them to mix, but they won't cleave together, they won't stick. So the very imagery and the wording tells you that the kind of clay that's been discussed here is clay that's already been fried, it's already a vessel, but it's in this form, in this word, sorry, in this phrase, and in this phrase, it's come to its time of judgment. So when you look at the imagery and the wording, they're all matching one with another. And I've got, I've got passages um, from the New Testament which basically show the same thing. All the New Testament passages, they'll show you that when it's talking about this clay, um, the ones from, that are taken from John, John chapter 9, all of those are dealing with the situation where Christ picks up some dry dirt, makes it into a paste and anoints someone's eyes to make them see. Again, I don't think that's pertinent to this situation here. So we just want to deal with a couple of more issues. We've looked at, so we're back to this sheet here. We've looked at Daniel chapter 2 and you'll see that in the Aramaic, I've given, I've pointed out all the verses with the clay and they've given those definitions that we've just read about. If you go to the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek Old, Old Testament. When they translated these verses and you parallel, you parallel them, you'll see they consistently use the same uh, Greek word, and it's, it's G3749. And so in the verses 33 to 45, when those people translated from the Aramaic into the Greek, they chose to use the word either earthenware or potsherd. So they recognised that the form of clay that's been introduced, which, is, which I've shown you from the Hebrew and Aramaic, that it's this type of clay already formed, they saw that and when they translated it into the Septuagint, that's, that's the words that they used. They never used the word clay or, or, or potter's vessel. So in verse 41, you'll see, um, it says in the Aramaic, the feet of toes, part of potter's clay. But in the Septuagint, it says the feet and toes, part of earthenware or earthware. So, just the final bit of logic. Let's turn to, unfortunately I didn't, I wasn't able to print this one off, the, these ones. Let's go to Psalms chapter 2, verse 9. Actually, before we turn to, to, to Psalms, let's go to Job chapter 2, verse 8. Job. We'll go to Job chapter 2, verse 8. Someone can read that. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. So, what he's using here is a shirt or a shard of clay and it's a bo broken fragment sure. of some kind of pottery and he's using it to scrape his wound. So yeah. this word potsherd yeah. is what Job uses to scrape himself <coughs> and when you look at the definition of it, it's the very same definition or this imagery that's brought to view in Daniel chapter 2, <coughs> the small shards that are being spoken of. If you pick up the word, uh, actually, let's go to Isaiah 45, verse 9. Yeah. No, no, no. Isaiah 45 is, is in this list of, of verses that you've got. Someone could read that. Isaiah 45, verse 9. Go unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? What thy work has he had no hands? Okay, I'm going to go to this pack here, and it's going to be on page three, and I'm going to read my interpretation of Isaiah 45, verse 9. So we just had 45, 9 from the King James. 
And my interpretation of this is, reads as follows. A woe to the person who complains with his maker. You are just a clay vessel like all the other clay vessels on the earth. The clay cannot argue with the potter about the kind of vessel that he has turned him into. So you'll, you'll probably need time to go back and analyse if my definition is what that verse is saying. But if it's correct, then what I'm saying is this. It's talking about a vessel that isn't happy with what it's turned into. So God has made you into something and you're not happy about that and you're complaining. And it says, you're just the same as any other vessel on the earth. From the, from God's looking down, he says, you're just the same as everyone else. You're not any different or any special. And then it says, the clay cannot argue with the potter about what kind of vessel he's been turned into. The reason why this is an important verse is because it talks about the potsherd twice in this passage, and then it says the clay. So what I'm saying is this, in Isaiah 45 verse 9, it uses the word potsherd, which means a vessel. I'm not trying to say it's a broken vessel or, or, or an intact vessel at this stage. I'm just saying it's a vessel. And then it says in the same verse, is the clay going to complain to its maker? So it's using the word clay and potsherd interchangeably. They're using it the in, the, in, the interchangeably in that verse. Clay and potsherd. So the clay that's being brought to view in that verse is a vessel. It's not a wet, malleable clay. It's not this sticky clay here that's ready to be used. It's, the, it's a clay that's already been turned into a vessel. And then it says, well, this vessel complained to God about what kind of a vessel it is. And it said, you've got no right to do that. Now, the reason why this verse is good is because if you take the definition um, or the, the word that's used for potsherd, it's H2789. 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 And if you do a word study on H2789, uh, so we're coming to the conclusion now, it... it I think it helps fill in what's going on here. We just read Job chapter 2, verse 8. And so it's the same Hebrew word, 2789, and it's going to define what a pot shirt is. It's some kind of thing that you can, a, a broken piece of um, pottery. Then let's go to Isaiah chapter 30. These, these aren't in your notes, sorry. Isaiah chapter 30. Verse 14. This talks about, it's, it's talking about the, the woe that's coming upon those who trust in Egypt. That's the context of this passage. But verse 14 says, And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a shard to take fire from the hearth, or to take water with all out of the pit. I don't have time to read the context of this, but what you picked up the phrase, it says, the potter's vessel. Every time we're going to see this phrase, potter's vessel, and I'm saying that's how it should have been, uh, that's, how it sh that, that's the intent of Daniel 2. It says clay, but it should be vessel. You see that from the definition of the word and from the imagery that we've briefly spoken about. So this phrase, potter's clay, often when people go to potter's clay, they see this as some kind of positive thing, but it's actually a potter's vessel. And every time we we'll give a couple of Bible verses that deal with potter's vessel, and potter's vessels is a church that's in a corrupt state, and what God has done, he's taken this vessel and he's smashed it, and it's in small flaky pieces like this. This is the clay that's, talks, that's spoken about as potter's clay in Daniel 2. I'll read the verse again, uh, Isaiah 30, verse 14. And he shall break it, the vessel, God's people, as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. And he's going to break it so small that you can't even use these pieces to carry ashes or to scoop up any water. And it, you can see that it gets from here that it's really talking about dirt because these fragments are so fine that it serves no purpose and it's going to be ready to be swept away. Um, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 19. Jeremiah chapter 19. If we had read from verse 9 to verse 14, we would have got a bit more of a context, but we'll do Jeremiah 19. 
This is the last passage that we'll go to. And we'll read from verse 1. Who's going to, uh, I don't know who's next on. Thus saith the Lord God, go and get the potter's earthen bottle, and take of the ancients of the people, and of the ancients of the priests. So, this is the story of Jeremiah. He's, t- uh, he's 19 1. He's told to take an earthen bottle or vessel and he's told to gather the elders together because he's going to do an enacted parable. Let's drop to verse 10. Then shalt thou break the bottle in the sight of the men that go with thee. So what I'm saying here is that he's going to get this vessel and he's going to break it and the breaking of the vessel is the condition of this clay here. And the reason he's breaking the vessel is obvious, you can already see the context of it, because it's an enacted parable of there was a vessel that God created, his people, who were fit for use, and now because they're in rebellion, he's going to give a story that says, this is the condition that when I look at you that you're in, you're this bottle that's been smashed and is no longer fit for purpose. And the next, the last verse is verse 11. And shall say unto them, thus says the Lord of hosts, even so will I break this people and this city as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made full again. And they shall bury them in Tophet till there be no place to bury. So once these vessels are broken, you see the definition when you break a vessel, a potter's vessel, potter's clay when it gets broken, it's, an, it's, a, it's a final judgment, it's irreparable. So when we go back to Daniel 2, and it uses the word or the phrase potter's clay. This clay is clay that looks like this. It's already been fired. And a better, a better way of expressing it would be potter's vessel. You can see that this clay is this kind of clay that's brought to view here. It's a potter. You can, um, all the verses that you need, that they're, all, they're all given in your notes. You can show that this potter's clay is actually a vessel that's been broken and a broken vessel is a definition of God's people Uh, I won't even put God's people, I've just put a a church which is in rebellion and it's not just any kind of rebellion, this rebellion is fatal so by the time that you've got where, where, you're, where you're using the term potter's clay, it's already a church that has received a fatal wound, if you like, that it, it's already been destroyed. And then any kind of progression that we would see is we'd see the Murray clay is that it's ready for judgment. So in summary, there's enough linguistical arguments, there's enough imagery arguments to show that the potter's clay and the miry clay are not a church that goes from good to bad. Okay. There was one argument that you brought up the other day that I thought was good, and you, you touched on it but didn't fully address it, and it's the point that when Sister White addresses the image, she says it's the metals decrease uh, in, in value, an increase in hardness, mm-hmm. and she says this represents the state of uh, the spiritual state, the spirituality, as much as the you know the state. Yes. Of and then, and when you get so so, it's always degrading. It's never it's never getting better. So the gold and silver and brass and iron, and then when you get down to the feet, <coughs> if it was good clay and then bad. Instead of a constant degression, if that's that word, it would increase a little and then it would get worse. So it doesn't follow the flow of prophetic or history getting as getting worse. given yeah. to us by spirit of prophecy. Right. And by the Bible. Mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your goodness towards us. As we wrestle with your word as we may be challenged by the thoughts and ideas that have been discussed this evening. We ask and pray that you would be with us, that you would guide us in our 
corporate and individual studies that, so that we might come to a clearer understanding of your word, that we might know for ourselves whether or not what has been presented this evening is in agreement with your will or not. Please help us to understand these things in a clearer fashion than we have in the past. Help us to be more diligent in our, in our studies, Father, so that we might not only glorify you, but we may be changing that process. We ask in the name of Jesus these things. Amen.